Over 400,000 Chinese citizens noticed their bank deposits freeze recently as almost $6 billion worth were shut down. And when they attempted to then withdraw their money, their requests were simply declined, leading to riots along the street. Most of this footage from the protests had been covered up by the Chinese Communist Party as concerns behind the impending real estate collapse looms large. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese homebuyers have refused to pay up to $300 billion worth of mortgage payments, which ponders the question if this is a replay of the 2008 housing bubble crash all over again. This economic downfall is due to a scam that has left many concerns around the projects these housing companies in China were taken upon. Signs of this bubble include a 20% decline in property sales and also a 30% decline in new construction starts, which could lead to a domino effect as banks fall under bankruptcy. But before we dive into the current issues, let's look at its history. Now the first thing we must understand about the Chinese banking system is that it relies on something called fractional reserves. And now I'm going to do a horrible edit where a magic piece of paper just appears. <laughs> anyway, um, now, this is where someone, I want to call him Greg, deposits $10,000 into the bank, and what the bank then does is it keeps $1,000 in something called a reserve, and then lends the remaining $9,000 through a loan to someone else, and we're going to call him Sarah. Now, the first thing we must notice is that Greg has deposited $10,000, so his bank, according to his bank statement, he has $10,000 in his account. Now the bank keeps the thousand and loans another nine thousand, but that nine thousand isn't deducted from Greg's ten thousand. So they've essentially created nine thousand dollars lent to Sarah through thin air. Now I'll explain that more in a second. But Sarah then spends her money to someone else. Let's say spends nine grand at a fish and chip shop. Don't ask me why. To Bob, who has nine thousand dollars and deposits it into the bank. Now the bank takes 10% of that $9,000, so that bank now has a total of $1,900, additionally from that thousand earlier. Now that bank then takes the remaining 90% of that initial $9,000, so $8,100, and loans it to the next person, <laughs> I don't know why I've underlined or explained, but Gertrude, <laughs> I don't know why she's so long compared to the rest of them. Anyway. Now, where they've made $9,000 and $8,100 in a thin air, so with an initial deposit of $10,000, they've essentially created $9,000 plus $8,100, so $17,100 at a thin air. And that's something we call credit. What this credit effectively means is that the bank believes that people won't just pull out all their money at once, especially multiple people. So they just keep a 10% small reserve that in case people withdraw some small amounts, they can give it to them. But they keep getting money deposited, they keep giving out loans, make more money, they can end up paying for in case people want to withdraw their money. So I'm gonna break this all down again. Greg, $10,000 into bank, they keep 10% in case he pulls out. They use the remaining $9,000 to loan to Sarah, and Sarah spends her money whoever she owed the money to. Let's say they owed the money to Bob. Bob gets $9,000 from Sarah, while Sarah's also paying off her little loan. Bob, $9,000 to the bank. The bank keeps the total of $1,900. $1,900, $8,100 gets sent to Gertrude. And this can be repeated up to 10 times using something called the monetary multiplier effect. So basically, the bank can leverage their money 10 times over to people who can loan, respend their money to someone, and then these people will then put money back into the bank account that they can do this over and repeat the process cycle over and over again. Now this may sound like a completely rigged system because the bank can just keep and keep on generating money for reasons that we might understand. Now where this fault is, you could say, is that what if 400,000 people all at the same time wanna withdraw their money from their bank account? And this is exactly what is happening within China right now. Since they're legally required to only keep 10% of the money, they don't have, actually have the money to give back to these people. And why would they? They're a business. They want people to keep depositing money so they can keep generating more money through loans and giving out money to people. So why, what stops them from saying, we don't, we don't have to give money back to you? 
Because once you deposit your money to a bank account, the bank doesn't actually have to give your money back to you at all. The bank can simply say no, cut everyone from their bank accounts and leave people not being able to withdraw large amounts of money. They might say, if you have, if everyone has $100,000 in their bank account, they say you can only withdraw $5,000 because that's less than 10% and it leaves a little buffer for them in case something happens. Now this is a completely unfair set of rules and is why the rich keep getting richer. But now I'll explain how this affects the Chinese housing market and how this can replicate 2008 in the US. Now what we must understand about Chinese culture is that it's much different from the West and that's because they are renowned for buying property as soon as possible when they're young and then housing family members all under the same roof. They see homes as a safe haven asset and this is because it goes up slowly and gradually rather than the volatile up and downs that we see in the stock market and crypto especially. They also see it as a tangible, safe and resilient asset. Around 70% of all millennials in China are homos, which is an absurd number considering the US is at only 43%. However, in the last two years, China's property market has absolutely soared after the pandemic, much like the rest of the world. And due to all the money printing and low interest rates, people are eager to buy more and more. However, as the economy has made a U-turn and it has started to slowly decline and interest rates started to hike, people aren't as eager anymore. Now, CNPC reported last August that between 70 and 80% of all household assets are stored in real estate in China. And this property boom called upon a new concept called the pre-sale model. This is where Chinese citizens would put down a house deposit, gather a loan from the bank, and slowly start paying off before the home is even built. Now, these companies would give a time frame of when the house is being built, and this is a great concept if they do. Because over the last two years after the pandemic, People would buy the home before it's built and house prices would already start going up. And with lots of money printing and low interest rates, this was a great idea. However, as the economy took a U-turn and went downwards and interest rates started to hike, along with some companies not delivering on their promises, it started to become a little bit ugly. Especially since 34.5% of property developers were funded by this pre-sale model. This soon started to become much like a pyramid scheme where the lower price house at the bottom would start funding the bigger, grander houses at the top. But once these ones at the bottom were starting to pull out because the time frame was getting pushed back months, six months, years later, however long, they'd start pulling out and as we all know with pyramid schemes, as the bottom comes out and can't fund the top, it all collapses. And with these eye-watering amounts of leverage, companies like Evergrande who took advantage of the property sector becoming the anchor of the Chinese economy. They noticed the insane reliance that the property sector had within China as it covered 28.7% of the total GDP, unlike America, which it only covered 17.3%. They also saw a shift where people moved from these urban country areas to the city. And in the housing reform of 1998, soon after Evergrande was created, only 460 million people or 33.3% or a third of the total population lived in the city. I say only because it's such a massive population. But in more recent times of 2021 or the last time this data was recorded, 940 million people lived in the city, which was a total of 64.7% of the total population of China. This relocation away from urban areas caused Evergrande to have exponential growth in a booming industry. So much that its annualized revenue growth between 2004 and 2020 was at 44%. And with over a thousand projects in over 200 cities across mainland China, we can see this rapid growth eventually come to a fall. So when they began to over leverage these pre-sale models and the middle class started pulling out, with Evergrande having $300 billion worth of debt, which is 2% of China's total GDP, the idea of a mass liquidation would likely take decades to solve due to the massive economic consequences on the property sector and China itself. The other fear is that there are also these empty homes and ghost cities that no one lives in due to all the pre-sale construction projects being wiped out. There are currently enough empty homes in China to house 90 million people, which is more than Germany, more than England, and for my home country, Australia, it's four times the population almost. Whilst also the birth rate in China is slowly diminishing, causing the population to slowly go down. So Chinese real estate is truly on the brink of destruction. Statisticians believe that by the year 2100, China's population will be below 600 million people, which is a massive decline. 
And this is mainly due to the one-child policy that lasted decades and only ended in 2015. So as all these older people start to pass away and we're left with a generation that has way less people and way less growth rate than the older generation had, it will lead to less jobs and so many more houses just left empty, which will cause the bubble to pop. Housing affordability is also among one of the worst in the world. Put it simply, in Beijing, it would take 50 years for the median household income to afford a medium priced home. Now let me put a bit of a comparison on that. We think of places like London, which is known for having one of the most unaffordable houses. However, the median income would only take 10 years to buy a median home. And it's the same as New York, it would only take 15 years. Hence making the denser parts of China some of the most unlivable in the world. But the big question remains, is this housing bubble the same as the Lehman Brothers collapse that led to the 2008 Great Financial Crisis? Or put it simply, if the most indebted Chinese property developer defaults, there's your major crisis. Now it's uncertain how large these effects are going to come, but it's guaranteed to affect global markets, that's for sure. Although the Chinese government will do as much as they can to contain the pending catastrophe from affecting their economy too drastically, all the branches in real estate account for 33% of China's total GDP, and with exports as the backbone of their economy, if anything fails, it could lead to devastation in the markets. However, we don't know the future. And that's it for today's video, guys. Thanks for tuning in to how China could possibly repeat the 2008 Great Financial Crisis all over again. Click on my last video where I talked about seven assets that are better than Bitcoin to have in your 20s. And don't forget to like and subscribe because I'm trying to get my message out to as many people as possible. So you helping and supporting the channel will help contribute to that mission. If you do want to buy Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrencies, then click on my link down below to get low fees on crypto. Also below on my socials, but anyway guys, hey now.